today we round up our loyalty month and we take our last message on the team for this year's loyalty month, which is all round fruitfulness. And our topic for today is consistent fruitfulness, key to reward. Consistent fruitfulness, key to reward. I want us to bow our heads and pray. Father, we want to thank you for yet another opportunity in your presence. And I just pray, Lord, that, Father, you will minister to us this morning. The Lord, as we round up this session on all-round fruitfulness, that, Father, you would launch us into all-time consistent fruitfulness in the name of Jesus. I just pray, Lord, that you tune our hearts today to hear from you. And I pray, Lord, that Father will receive from your throne of grace this morning and that your word will indeed work transformation in our hearts in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father, and to you be all the glory. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Our text will be reading from three passages of Scripture this morning. And our first text is taken from, first, from Colossians chapter 1. And I'll read verse 10. Colossians chapter 1. And I'll read verse 10. And I'm reading from the New International Version. It says, So that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please Him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. And then let's quickly turn to first. Peter chapter 5. First Peter chapter 5, and I'll read from verses 1 through to 4. It says, To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's suffering, who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, and not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being example to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. And then finally, we turn to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And I'll read the very last verse of that chapter, verse 58. And it says, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm, let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. I want us to all read that passage of scripture together. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 58. Let's go. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Praise the Lord. I want us to always remember this. That our labor in the Lord is not in what? It's not in vain. The Lord rewards faithfulness. But before talking about faithfulness, I just want to briefly talk about how 
seriously, I believe the Lord takes the issue of fruitfulness. Just to provide the context before we begin to talk about reward. You know, as, as I look through the Bible, I, I see consistency. The Lord wanting us to be fruitful. Post-creation, the Lord was very clear in Genesis. He says we should bear fruit and multiply. Though that may apply to being productive. But again, at redemption, our Lord Jesus Christ, in John 15, gave what I call the fruitfulness commission. In John 15, 16, where he said, we should go and do what? And bear fruit. He says we should go and do what? Bear fruit. I call that the fruitfulness commission. And that was coming from our Lord Jesus Christ. God has shown consistency in his desire that we are fruitful. And as we go through scriptures in the course of our sharing, we would see that God has been consistent in requiring that we are fruitful, in desiring that we are fruitful, and his commitment to rewarding us as we remain consistently fruitful. And as I look at the dimensions of the reward, I see that some reward, the, you have eternal dimension of the reward, where our Lord said, look, we would reign with him in eternity as part of our reward for fruitfulness. And then the passage of scripture that we read also talks about receiving the crown of glory. Receiving the crown of glory. I think these are things to really look forward to. They may look a bit far-fetched because we seldom talk about heaven. We enjoy this earth so much and so well. But the reality is that we're going to be spending eternity where? In heaven. And I always remember the song by Jim Reeves. He says, this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. Heaven is not my home. Then, Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me. Heaven is in there. And I can feel at home in this world anymore. But the reality is that we feel very much at home in this world. And we really give thought to heaven. We really give thought to eternity in heaven. But I pray that the Lord will help us to begin to lay treasures in heaven. I pray that the Lord will help us to build up rewards in heaven. I pray that all of us who are here will be in heaven to reign with him for eternity. My prayer has always been, that if on a Sunday morning the Lord Jesus Christ comes, I want this church hall, I want the children hall, the teens church, this entire premises to be what? Empty. Amen? Amen. I want it to be empty. When was the last time you thought of the rapture? You know, one thing that challenged me a few years back, I went to visit my daughter in in Canada, and I was in Hamilton. And I stayed in an apartment. And unknown to me, because of time difference, and I was receiving a lot of calls, my, the line in my room had a parallel line to another room. And my calls were disturbing the people in that other room. So what they did was to go and disconnect the phone. And I didn't know. So my daughter kept trying to reach me, and she wasn't getting through to me. Then, you know, this mobile roaming was not very popular. So suddenly, after a few hours, I saw her. She walked into the room. And I said, oh, I wasn't expecting you. She said, ah, that she kept trying to reach me on the phone. 
and she wasn't getting through. So she got worried that, in fact, at this stage, she thought that maybe the rapture had taken place. And she is here and I'm gone. You know, I didn't have the courage to tell her that, uh, oh, you are even thinking of rapture. I was not thinking of it. <laughs> but I was really impressed that she was thinking of rapture. When was the last time you thought of rapture? So there are eternal rewards. But there are also rewards here for fruitfulness. There are rewards here. And the Bible assures us of that. But again, as I was thinking through all of this, I mean, one that kept resonating with me is, is, is really the joy of obedience. You know, the joy of obedience. You know, when you obey God, there's this joy that just floats your heart. When you're in tune with God, there's this joy that you experience. It's just his joy. And I think you won't exchange it for any other thing. So when the Lord says he wants you to be fruitful, and you are being fruitful, there's a joy that comes with it. Because you are being obedient and you are responding to God. So there are all kinds of rewards that come with faithfulness. And I pray that the Lord will help us. And that's why 1 Corinthians 15, 58 reminds us that our labor is not in vain. Because you see, it's so easy for us to begin to ask, what is my benefit for all this in self? The people I'm doing things for don't even appreciate it. They're better for you. Who is watching you? God. And God will reward. So let me just quickly talk on three key things. One is the measure of fruitfulness. Then the second one is motivation for consistent fruitfulness. And then lastly, the means to consistent fruitfulness. Now, I really want to talk about the measure of fruitfulness. Because I had issues with that because I kept asking all kinds of questions. And I'm sure I'm not alone in this. And again, because sometimes you don't even know when you have done enough. You don't know when you have done enough. Or sometimes we may be quick to congratulate ourselves, to say, look, I have done so well. And this set me thinking and looking into scriptures to say, look, what is the measure of God's expectations? What does he expect of us? What does he expect of me? How do I assess his expectation? I've had cause to share this in church here before. You know, but looking through the Bible, I looked at John. I looked at where he talked about uh, the vine. He talked about fruitfulness. And there I saw that he came with four classes of fruitfulness. The very first class is no fruit. And what happens to the brand that bears no fruit? It's caught. It's caught and thrown into what? It's good to always remember that. When you don't bear fruit, you are what? Eh? Yeah. So that's one class. Then the next class is you bear fruit, right? And then he tells us that when you bear fruit, then he prunes you so that you can do what? You can bear more fruit. And then the fourth level is you are then pruned more. And he tells us that God is glorified when you bear much fruit. And I reckon when the Bible says much fruit, I mean, it must really be much, right? And then I looked at some of the parables. I looked at the parable of the talent in Matthew 25. And I saw the servant who got five talents. And then he made how many more? Five more. He was commended. And then the second servant who got two talents made how many more? Two more. He was commended. The Lord commended both of them and said, good and faithful servant. And when I look at their performance in percentage terms, those guys scored a hundred what? Percent. 
Now, by every standard, 100% is what? It's very high, right? And then the third guy, he scored what? Zero. And the question that kept going through my mind is, why did God not slot in somebody who scored 50% and then commend him? Or, you know, somebody who scored 30%. You know, in Nigeria, we keep adjusting the pass mark. Depending on where you come from. So, but we have 100%. Not to even talk about the parable of the minas, where they all got one one and somebody made ten. And that shoots you to one thousand percent. Now, when I look at all of this, it just tells me that God's expectation is, is high. It just tells me that God has high expectations of us. So we need to re-examine ourselves very carefully. Both in terms of the manifestation of the fruit, in terms of service in the household of God or in God's ministry, your response to his call, your work for God. How are you fearing? What is God's expectation of our fruitfulness? Yes, I know that there is a school of thought that will say, well, all God wants is that we should be faithful. That's true. We should be faithful. But somehow that faithfulness also translates. And being faithful means that you are giving your best and giving your all. I pray that the Lord will help us. So God has very high expectations. And then I went on to ask myself, so God, God has this very high expectation, but is it, is it justified? Is it justified to expect so much? You know, when we did, I remember in 96, I went for a course in Maui, and um, David Wong was teaching us the leader and his family. And then he gave us a matrix on, you know, children from different homes. And he talked about, the, you, you have the axis, the Y and the X axis. One is expectation, and then the other one is support. In a home where you have very high expectation and very low support. You end up with children that are stressed. Because you can have homes like that where the parents want the children to come first. They want them to make first class. They want them to be the best. But in terms of support, they, don't give, them, they give them low support. You don't have the child with the homework. You don't give the child sufficient support. So you end up with stressed children. And then there are some homes where they give very high support, but very low expectation. You give the child a lot of support. Then the child goes to school, comes back with a report card, is last in the class. And then you'll be patting him on the head. Ah, it's okay, don't worry. Next time, try it. We're told that children from such homes are spoiled children. And then you have some homes where expectation is low, support is low. They don't give support, they don't expect much. Anything you bring is okay. Apathy. Children from those homes are what? Apathy. And then where you have high expectation, and high support, you have children that are balanced. And now borrowing from that, and I look at our relationship with God, is God justified 
to have such a high expectation of us. What is God's support level? Would we rate it as low or as high? When I look at God, He created us. We fell into sin. He came up with a redemption plan. He makes the Holy Spirit available to us to support us. In creating us, the Bible tells us in Ephesians that he brings the best of his workmanship. The best of God's workmanship into creating you and I. Into endowing you and I. Preparing you for the good works that he has set for you and I to do. I came up with the conclusion that indeed God gives high support. So his expectation is justified. His expectations are justified. So, and I really want you to think about this. And then when I look at the duration of our fruitfulness. You know, sometimes it's so easy for us to, you know, to tell ourselves that, look, ah, I have tried. Let me rest more too. Right? Ah, you know, I've been serving. I've been Sunday school teacher for four years now. It's time to go and relax. Let me rest more too. Let others work. I've been in council for four years. Ah, Tired. I've done. Uh, let someone else come and do this. I've been doing evangelism for ten years. I was in that. That was also my story. I remember when we um, when we we got to some reasonable level with starting of this church, and I said to myself that look, let me just take it easy. Let me cool down. Because in Yaba, I was head of the church planting and pioneering session. Then I became head of ministry for missions and evangelism. And it was always pressure packed. The senior pastor, who was also the general overseer, would call me then and give me targets. Sometimes you say, Look, Peter, this year we are planting 10 churches. Our church must always set the pace nationally. And then, you know, we would go on and on. Most times, we would meet our target, and then we would exceed. But it was a lot of work. Sometimes, in our bid to meet those targets, at the beginning of the church year, we would start training for people, prospects, people that we think we would use for church planting. And typically, because the general overseer will be driving those training himself, I devise a strategy of being forced on his program for the day. Otherwise, you will suffer huge backlash for delays. So those programs will start at 6 a.m. And I live in VGC. So I have to leave here maybe 5 a.m. every Saturday, boom, to Yaba. Two, twice I had, an, I had accidents. The first one was I carried a horse on, the, on this express road. But the Lord delivered me. The second one was on the Falomo Bridge. So after all of that, we were involved in mission work, planted churches in um, Central African Republic, went to Senegal, planted a church in Dakar, had a mission work in Kaulak, very hard field. You go there, it's so hot, you can't sleep in the room. We'll go to the top of the house to sleep in nets, the mosquitoes will go through the net and bite you very well. So I then said to myself, I said, ah, man, this, this, this is enough. It's time to cool down. And then one day the Lord rebuked me and said, Peter, who, 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 how do you know that it's enough? What do you know that is enough? What is enough? Do you know my plans? Do you know my expectations? I had to go on my knees and ask the Lord to forgive me. I had to ask the Lord to forgive me. And after that, 
my work took a different dimension. The Hagar Institute invited me to join their international faculty. I started shuttling between their two centers in Singapore and in Maui. I had a very hectic travel schedule. I was still working with Calvary Ministries. I was traveling. It got to a state that air hostesses will know me. That was a month I had flying hours, about 88 real flying hours. But I thank God. It exposed me to a lot of people. There was hardly any country that I did not have a contact then. Just sharing with Christian leaders, working on strategies for evangelism. And then I got into uh, RBC Ministries, now our Daily Bread Ministries. And then going around, still doing it, God has brought me back to this local church again. And I don't know where he's taking me to next. But that's my journey and that's my story. So we shouldn't be quick to congratulate ourselves. We shouldn't be quick to say, oh, I have done enough. We shouldn't be quick to say, oh, it's time for me to rest and take a break. It's only God that determines when it's break time. It is only God that determines when it is enough. You don't decide it. And I pray that the Lord will help us. So let's quickly look at the measure of fruitfulness. Let's, let's move away from the measure of fruitfulness. And then look at the motivation for fruitfulness. What should motivate us to be fruitful? As I think through this, I think one primary motivation for fruitfulness should be our desire to please God. And our example in this is our Lord Jesus Christ. Our Lord Jesus Christ made it very clear that his desire, his food, is to do the will of who? Of God. To do the will of his Father. To do the work of his Father. And if Christ is our example, then that must be some key motivation for us. Our desire to please God. Because God wants us to be fruitful. So we must desire to be fruitful because it, it pleases God. And I pray that the Lord will help us. I pray the Lord will put in us that desire to always want to please him. And then the desire to fulfill God's given mission and vision for our lives. You look at Jeremiah 1.5. The Lord had to remind Jeremiah that long before he was formed in his mother's womb. Eh? Yes. So each of you, each of us must recognize the fact that God has a purpose for creating us. And we need to fulfill that purpose. So that desire to want to please God is very important. It's very important. And that should be some motivation for us to be fruitful. And it is only in doing what God has given us to do that the Lord will bless us. It's not when you do what you want to do. And that's why I keep telling people, it is not what can I do for God. So you don't just look at God, what can I do for God? You know, it's, you know, you know when you're dealing with a lesser person, you look at him, call him, oh, Peter, what can I even do for you, you know, so that I can make your life better? But when you that, what does God want me to do? But many of us just decide, what, do I, what can I do for God? So that when, even in his service, you look for those things, and, no, I can't do this one. Yes, uh, I think, yeah, I can do this for God, I can do this. But you can only receive reward 
when you are doing those things that God wants you to do. And there's one story that I never forget because, you know, that illustration just captures this point. You know, we used to have a young girl who used to live with us and she was supposed to help my wife. She was with us. You know, and she was a bit difficult. But somehow, on this day, I don't know where that wave came from. He decided that she wanted to just make my wife happy, just to please her. So my wife was upstairs sleeping. So she went into the kitchen and decided to cook. And then she had this fresh fish in her deep freezer. And then the girl brought it out and used the fresh fish to prepare a goosey sauce or soup. And then went on to prepare spaghetti for lunch. Now, having done all of this, she was cool. She was feeling cool with herself. So she just sat down and was waiting for Madame to come. So when Madame came down, came into the kitchen, the girl was all smiling, just waiting for commendation. And then she opened her pot and saw a goosey soup. Say, ah, ah, this fresh fish. I was reserving it for stew sauce. Why did you use it for a goosey? Ah, what is this? Spaghetti. Ah, look at the timetable, the schedule for... We're supposed to have boiled yam today, not spaghetti. And then the girl just went like this. Oh. It's like, you this woman, I can never please you. But how do you please her when you are doing OP? OP is off point. She was sad. Her mother was unhappy. All she needed to have done was to ask. Right? What do you want me to do? And I think that story just caps it all. In our dealings with God, many of us decide what to do for God. As against asking God, God, what do you want me to do? I pray that the Lord will help us. And then another motivation for us too is that as his children, we must desire to contribute our part and to succeed like the saints that have gone ahead. And when you look at Hebrews chapter 12 and you read about those saints and also in the 11, Hebrews 11, I'm sure you also desire that you live a life that would also make a mark. That should be motivation for us to be fruitful. And then finally, is a desire to avoid failure. The desire to avoid failure of not bearing fruit and then the consequences. As you look at John 15, verse 2, we're told that the branch that does not bear fruit, what happens to that branch? In Luke 13, 6 to 9, too, our Lord Jesus Christ shared the parable of the fig tree. And he talked about how the owner of the fig tree, over a three year period, kept coming, hoping that he would find fruit. He didn't. And what did he say? He said they should do what? They should cut it. Though there was an appeal for one more year. But that story did not tell us what happened after the one year. And then finally, we also saw in Matthew 25, the parable of the talent. The servant that got one talent and was unfruitful. The master had very harsh words for that servant. Harsh words. Words like wicked. Words like lazy. And then in verse 30 of that passage, we're told that the master said, he ordered that he be thrown into darkness where there is weeping and what? 
gnashing of teeth. Your guess is as good as mine. Where is that? And what's the means to consistent fruitfulness? The very first one is we need to abide in Christ. On our own, we can do nothing. We need to remain connected. If you are not connected to Christ, you can't be fruitful. We need to abide in Christ. We need to abound in his word. We need to abound in his word. We need to have good knowledge of the word of God. So that we proclaim the word. We confess the word. We declare the word because the word is life. We need to be attentive to fruitfulness and to the reward. We must focus our eyes on Christ. Hebrews 12 reminds us that we must focus on Christ. Whatever our challenges are, we must focus on Christ because nothing must separate us from the love of Christ. Romans 8, 35 to 39 tells us, what shall separate us from the love of Christ? We must anticipate abundant fruitfulness. We must anticipate it. We must be expectant as we walk at it and the Lord will help us. We must avoid self-glorification. We must avoid self-glorification, taking glory for what the Lord is doing through us. We must be conscious of that because God does not want to share his glory with any man. You need to watch it. Don't even allow people to lure you into sharing that glory. And please, don't push people into sharing that glory. But we need to watch it because we take primary responsibility particularly for ministers, for leaders, before they begin to praise you and you begin to enjoy those accolades. And then before you know what's happening, you begin to share and you begin to take self-glory. I pray that the Lord will help us. And then finally, we need to antagonize opposition to fruitfulness. Anything in your life that stands between you and fruitfulness, you must resist. You must confront. You must antagonize. You must deal with it. Sometimes we're in a spiritual warfare because the devil doesn't want you to be fruitful. The devil wants you to fall into the class of no fruit so that what can happen to you, you can be caught. Because ultimately, he doesn't want us to reign with God in eternity. So he's going to do anything. He's going to throw things at us. So we need to be sensitive, and I pray that the Lord will help us. So as Christians, we need to remember that the Lord has called us to fruitfulness. The commission is that we should go and bear fruit. And Colossians talks about bearing fruit, continuous tense. So we must continue to bear fruit. And that's the key to reward. Continuous tense. I just want us to do a bit of introspection as we bow our heads to pray. I want us to do a bit of introspection. What is our mindset? Are we cool enough? Or do we think that we've done enough? Or are we continuing in our fruitfulness? Are we focused in our expectation of reward? We must, as Christians and God's laborers, remain consistent in our relationship with God as we look forward to his imperishable and everlasting reward. One thing that we said is that 
To be fruitful, we need to abide in Christ. That is primary. If you are not in Christ, you can't even begin to talk about fruitfulness. Is there anyone here who has not given his life to Christ? You are not connected to Christ. You are not in Christ. You are not abiding in Christ. And today, you want to get into the path of fruitfulness. And as a very first step, you want to give your life to Christ. So that you can begin to abide in Christ. You can become connected to Christ. So that the process of fruitfulness can start in your life. Do we have any such person who would like to say, yes, today I want to give my life to Christ. I want to be connected to Christ. I want to abide in Christ. You want to give your life to Christ. You've never done so before. Just signify by raising up your hand where you are. I will get someone to pray with you quickly. You want to give your life to Christ. Wherever you are. If you are an online worshiper, you want to give your life to Christ, just touch the device before you and ask that the Lord Jesus Christ should come into your life. Begin to confess your sins and ask that the Lord should forgive you. And if you are here with us, just signify by raising up your hands and I'll get one of our leaders to pray for you. God bless you, brother. Any other person you want to give your life to Christ? Any other person you want to give your life to Christ? This is your chance. It's a unique opportunity. Don't allow this pass you by. This is our last Sunday, this loyalty month. You want to connect and begin to become fruitful. Don't take the chance. You want to give your life to Christ? Just signify by raising up your hands, and I'll get someone to pray with you quickly. I want the rest of us to begin to talk to God. Do you desire consistent fruitfulness? I want you to do, just examine your life. We've talked about the measure of God's expectation. Where are you? What are you doing? Are you involved in one form of service or the other? Who has put you in that service? Are you really working for God? I want you to begin to talk to God. And I want us to now begin to pray. Let us begin to pray. Let us begin to talk to God. Father, we... Come before your throne of grace and ask that you help us. And I pray, Lord, that, Father, like we have prayed earlier, that, Lord, you subject us to your own examination. And, Lord, reveal our hearts, reveal our shortcomings. But, Lord, help us with the gaps in our life. Help us, Lord, and put us on the path of consistent fruitfulness. Help us, Lord, to recognize the measure of your expectations of us. Because, Lord, you give so much support to us. You've given us everything that we need to meet your high expectations. Help us, Lord, but as we go into the second half of this year and even the rest of our time on this side of eternity, the Lord will be focused on fruitfulness. Fruitfulness in accordance with your will and purpose for our lives. Fruitfulness in the line of your mission and vision for our lives. Lord, help us. On our own, we can do nothing but we know that with you all things are possible. Lord, help us, Father, 
and continue to bring us to your own path, your path of righteousness. Anytime we stray, Lord, call our attention and help us, Lord, to maintain consistent focus in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Take all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.